Well, good evening, everyone. Again, my name is Andre Copeland. I manage interpretive programs at Brookfield Zoo. I come from a long history of working at Lincoln Park Zoo, then transferring over to Brookfield Zoo, have a background in animal care, coordinating outreach programs, and currently managing interpretation at Brookfield Zoo. Basically overseeing the messaging that we utilize to help connect people with our animals, with our conservation efforts, as well as our ethics behind animal care and welfare. But I'm really happy to be here today because one of the things that I've been connected with since my childhood has been bugs. Anybody who knows me, two things you can get me talking about forever, Bigfoot and bugs. So today we're going to leave Bigfoot alone and we're going to talk about some of my favorite bugs and those are actually pollinators. And I have to admit, as I was growing up, pollinators didn't start out to be my favorite of the bugs. Actually, it was spiders. I have a very, very deep connection to spiders. Um, it's something that I got from my mother. And when I was growing up, I was a very, very sickly young child. I was born, I'm going to date myself, I was born in 1963, small army base, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I was born with double pneumonia. My lungs didn't form fully, and because of that, I suffered with asthma throughout my life. Once a year until I was 12, I would get sick, and I would be hospitalized for pneumonia. And when they would put me in the hospital, they would put me in the bed, and they would have this big tent around me. And it's called an oxygen tent. They wouldn't let my mother stay, and so I would start crying when she would get ready to leave. And so my mother said, look, when I was young, one of the things I used to do when I was in my bed at night, I used to watch spiders go across the ceiling. <laughs> and I would think to myself, if this little animal could make it from one side to the other, that must be a huge feat for that animal. So if I think to myself, I'm strong enough to overcome, I can overcome. And she said, and I want you to feel the same way. She said, so until I get back, if you can't sleep, I want you to watch the ceiling for spiders. <laughs> and so that's what I did. And ever since I was a kid, I always had this special fondness for spiders. So I studied spiders. I wanted to find out how spiders reacted in their environment. And then I went on to find out how do spiders shape and influence culture. And that's when I began to start to open my eyes to the other bugs of the world, especially pollinators. And one of the things that I discovered is that throughout history, people and pollinators have always had a very, very tight connection. And if we work together, even though pollinators <coughs> are facing a huge fight, people and pollinators can continue to have that tight connection if we work together. Now, before I go any further, I want to find out if a few of you would share with me what you hope to get out of me being here this evening. I have a lot of pictures, a lot of slides, way too much information to get through, but I wanted to make sure I had enough to cover anything that you all might want to talk about, and then there are things I can just breeze by, but I want to make sure I don't skip anything that might be important to you. So yes. I want to know how to grow milkweed. Want to know how to grow milkweed? I came here last year. I got three kinds of seeds. I very meticulously and carefully planted them in the ground. Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Excellent. I'm glad you said that. Hopefully, I brought enough. I brought 50 copies of this handout. Most of them are in these discreet white envelopes. <laughs> Inside these envelopes, there is a native wildflower mix that does have butterfly milkweed in it. Inside here are the types of flowers, the company that the flowers came from, as well as an entire planting guide from Applewood Seed Company. So that should help you out with information that you need. Also give you a place that you can go to 
for more information, as well as to research some types of seeds that you might want in your area. So I'm glad you brought that up. Yes? Um, since you're talking about pollinators, maybe you talk briefly about the status of honeybees. Status of honeybees. We will definitely do that. Yes? How about the nighttime pollinators? You talk about moths and other things? The nighttime pollinators, we'll talk a bit about moths and go over those as well. Anything else? Hummingbirds. Yes, hummingbirds. Excellent. Yes. Good. Are those things all native seeds? Yes, they are all Midwest native seeds, <coughs> native to Illinois, Indiana, and the surrounding states. Yes. Yes. Um, local initiatives. Local initiatives. Excellent. Yes. And I think bats, uh, do they pollinate also? And bats. Do bats pollinate? All right. Excellent. Well, I think we're going to be able to cover that if we're going through here something parts, a thought, or not covering something you want to talk about, let me know. So I know, can you hit, um, there's a light switch there, I believe it's the one closest to me. That should turn these lights off. Yeah, excellent. All right. So we're going to get started to talk again about pollinators and people. We start to take a look at pollination and how pollinators are connected to people. Now, I do have a slide here that talks a bit about pollination. And basically, this is what pollination is. Pollen's created by the anther or stamen of a male plant. Pollen sticks to a bee's hairs on their legs, especially, whether it's a bumblebee, whether it's a honeybee, or it actually sticks to the legs or the wings of a butterfly, other pollinators, and then is transferred to the stigma or the pistil of the female plant. And this. <laughs> is the story of the birds and the bees. <laughs> I never understood that when my mother said, but birds and the bees. Why do I say that? I say that because there are a lot of different pollinators. And so we heard a few people say some things about moths. We heard some people say bees. We heard some people say bats. Any other pollinators? Humans. Humans, yes. Didn't have that one on the slide, but yes. Humans have started to pollinate. They've actually have people now developing little robotic bees to pollinate. <laughs> Believe it or not, trying to help with the pollinator crisis. And let's take a look at some of our pollinators here. Talk a bit about bees, and that's representing our honeybees and our bumblebees. Butterflies representing our butterflies and our moths. Just put one, two up there. Hummingbirds. <coughs> a lot of people usually don't think about hummingbirds as pollinators. And the mighty ant, believe it or not, ants do pollinate, especially a group specific to the Mediterranean. Beetles. Anybody ever had the good fortune to see a water lily? The water beetles are very important for pollinating water lilies. And they're back. And we are going to talk a bit about them. Now, one of the unique things about these animals is that each pollinator has something known as pollinator syndrome, meaning that they are specially designed to pollinate specific plants in very specific ways. And a lot of times, looking at their body can help you figure out what they pollinate. So for example, pumpkins are gourd crops, low to the ground. They do have beautiful flowers, but a lot of times laying on the ground in a vine. Now even though animals can pollinate, believe it or not, flies do some incidental pollinating as well. Of these four, if you had to guess, which one of these four do you think is probably the major pollinator of gourd? Bumblebee. Excellent. Very good. Bumblebees have the unique behavior of when they get on a plant, they start to shake around. <laughs> they do a little shimmy, and they really spread that pollen around. Very important for pollinating these types of crops. What about this? Honeysuckle. 
Look at those long tubes. Hummingbirds. Oh, you all are too sharp for me. Yes, the hummingbird. What gave it away? Long pointy feet, that's right. Sticking right there inside. So honeysuckle, very, very connected to the hummingbird. All right, how about goldenrod? People say honeybee, ants. Now honeybees, yes, do pollinate golden rocks. So do bumblebees. Ants, not so much. Bats, nope, and we'll talk about why in a minute. The butterflies. Now you hear a lot of debate amongst scientists and ecologists as to how important butterflies are to pollination. The fact of the matter is, butterflies do pollinate and they love landing on flowers that give them a wide landing space. And the cool thing about butterflies is they have a larger range than your bees. The bees have a relatively small home range, whereas your butterflies tend to spread out. So they help spread the pollen out. So butterflies are important pollinators. But what about mangoes? Ooh, now look at that beautiful ball. As again, we said nighttime pollinators like moths. Cool thing about moths is moths can actually see ultraviolet light. So plants actually kind of glow to them. So it's really cool for moths, unless they're in scorpion country. Because <laughs> scorpions have bodies that kind of glow the same way, and some researchers feel that's what helps attract prey to the scorpion. So sometimes they fly right to the scorpion, not so lucky. All right, which of these, and this is a carpenter bee. We'll talk a bit about how to recognize them a little bit later. And one more. <coughs> all right, so people are saying bat. You all are very sharp, excellent. Now, bats are important pollinators. However, the bats that pollinate tend to be in your tropical country. They tend to be in your rainforest, tropical areas, where you get a lot of your tropical fruits. However, bats do pollinate some things here in the United States. <coughs> some of our most important pollinators are the bumblebee. You can always tell the bumblebee, large, very fuzzy, and it's really cool if you ever come upon a bumblebee nest because they'll fly up and then they'll hover in there stare at you. <laughs> I was actually talking to one of my neighbors next door. She's like, Andre, oh my gosh, there are bees out here. I'm going to get stung. And I'm like, what's going on? And she was like, they're killer bees. And I'm like, killer bees? What? I was like, I saw that movie back in the 70s. So I went out there to take a look. And yeah, the bumblebee right there. I was delighted to see it. And as we talked, it looked at me and looked at her. Butterflies would come and chase the butterflies away. And then it would look at me and look at her. And after our conversation, she realized, yeah. What was I afraid of? Bumblebee isn't this aggressive animal that I thought it was. And I was able to help her understand, look for a large body animal that looks like it shouldn't be able to fly. <laughs> and very, very fuzzy. Now, of course, it has a friend that's often mistaken for the bumblebee. This is the carpenter bee. It's the one that you see coming out of the holes on the wooden deck. <laughs> you have wooden siding, and you're like, oh my gosh, and people are like, I saw a bumblebee. But if you take a look at the abdomen, it's kind of bald and waxy. And that's how you can tell the carpenter bees apart from the honeybees. But still very important pollinators, such as our beautiful honeybee. See, not quite brightly yellow colored as the bumblebee, not as big and chubby, <coughs> kind of thin and streamlined, more of a burnt orange color. And take a look at our bats. <coughs> if you ever visit the southwestern part of the United States, and you go to Arizona, the Saguaro National Forest, fruit bats will come across the border from Mexico and they pollinate saguaro cactus. 
And if you ever have had prickly pear fruit, delicious, especially if you have prickly pear glazed food. So they stick their heads all the way in the flowers, and that's why you saw that bat just covered in pollen on the face. So it has to be a wide flower they can just stick their entire head into, pull out as they're lapping up the nectar with their tongue. And there's the ant that I was telling you about. This Mediterranean rug, the ants that actually crawl inside, you see it gives off a lot of pollen, the pollen gets all over the ant's body, and the ants in big numbers help to pollinate. The beetles I was telling you about, with the water lilies, and even a beautiful butterfly on the cone nose flower year. And as you can see, take a look at the way these flowers are shaped. And the butterfly's long adapted mouth part to stick right down in there like a straw. Just like sipping the big gold from 7-Eleven. <laughs> Our hummingbird, again hovering in place with that honeysuckle. But even some of the animals we may not like quite as much <laughs> because they will defend their territory. Ball face hornet. Hornets and some of your other wasps will actually pollinate at times. They usually eat meat more often, or they will be parasites of other animals. But at times, they will seek nectar, pollinate, but take a look at that body. Pretty bald. Now, when these animals work together in harmony, you can have beautiful, beautiful culinary delights. Anybody here like strawberries? <laughs> How about mango? Well, if I have this recipe for you in the handout, strawberry mango fruit salad, I've made this before, it is delectable. And you can have your choice of using agave nectar or honey, either one to sweeten it. But if you choose honey, you can actually get honey from local beekeepers that taste different. Whether the bees have been feeding on star thistle, orange blossom, blueberry blossom, all has a very different taste. But if you take a look, without fruit bats, you probably wouldn't have any mangoes. <coughs> Oranges, limes, depend a lot on honeybees as well as bumblebees. Well, honeybees mostly, the strawberries depend upon bumblebees and honeybees because they grow low to the ground. <coughs> and then, of course, getting honey, you need your bees. And these are things that help connect pollinators to people. But again, why are they important? When you think about beauty, beauty comes in a lot of different forms. And most often, people will take a look at the colors of nature when they are creating art. And sometimes, nature itself can be art. For example, people by the thousands visit the Azalea Festival in Tokyo every year to see these beautiful flowers. They do the same thing in the UK, Johnston Gardens, to visit the rhododendron. Now the reason I showed you this is because I wanted to talk a bit about one of the first connections that pollinators had to people. Has anybody ever heard about pollinators being used as a form of national defense? No? All right, excellent. First century BC, the Romans were going to invade civilization called Heptachomedes. Don't have to read all of this. So Pompey sent a thousand soldiers to descend upon this small civilization. Now, what the people in this civilization realized was <coughs> is that the Romans were used to pillaging, taking whatever they could. So they got together with the beekeepers and left out 
a cache of honey as the Romans were walking through this narrow ravine. The Roman soldiers saw this, said, hey, great. We're going to grab the cache of honey. We're going to eat it. We're going to take everything these people left. But they soon fell ill. They fell ill, stomach issues, some of them with delirium, and this small civilization was able to come out and beat a thousand Roman soldiers, where they were outnumbered at least two to one. The reason being is that beekeepers know the alkaloids in rhododendrons, as well as azaleas, are toxic to people. And honey made from bee, when they have been feeding on that, can be used to make people sick. And so they were actually used as a form of national defense for this society for many years. Now, this isn't the only way pollinators have been used. Has anybody ever heard of Princess Olga of Kiev? Well, in about 1912, Princess Olga's husband, Prince Igor, got a little greedy. He was going around collecting what we now know as taxes and decided to go to a civilization called the Drevlings and tax them twice. They weren't having it, so unfortunately, they dispatched Prince Igor pretty quickly. And then they got the bright idea, hey, since we killed him, why don't we have his wife, who is now a widow, marry our prince? Now, why they thought this would work, I don't know. They sent 20 of their ambassadors over there to try to convince her to marry their prince, and every widow buried them alive. <laughs> but then she decides to come send word to them, you know what, I've changed my mind, I'm going to go ahead and marry her. But I'm going to need some help from you. I need you to send some of your best men with me to accompany me on a journey so I can convince all of my people that this marriage is a good idea. They said, excellent, great. So they sent some of their important dignitaries, landowners, and when they got there, Prince Solva said, you know, this was a long journey. Why don't you go into the bathhouse, get cleaned up? They all said, great. Went into the bathhouse, she set it on fire and burned them all about. <laughs> <laughs> now, why the Trevelange didn't catch on by then, I don't know. Because then she says, I'd like to invite about 5,000 of you over to a feast, a morning feast for my deceased husband. The Drevlins are like, okay. <laughs> 5,000 of them go over there. And what does Princess Olga do? She serves them a drink called mead that is made from honey. Using the honey, or when bees were feeding off of rhododendrons and azaleas, they fell sick, and her small army was able to lay waste to all of those ambassadors. So again, another way that pollinators have been used in history and connected to our tight history. But how are pollinators connected to us today? Does anybody feel that they have a connection to pollinators? Okay. Food. Food. Excellent. Food. How many people here, for example, say like almonds or cashews? You do? Hold a finger up. All right. One finger. So how many people like blueberries? Peaches? Nectarines? How about a good steak every once in a while? <laughs> All right. Anybody like to wear cotton? Anybody like alternative homeopathic cures for things such as arthritis? Excellent. So you've got seven ways you are connected to pollinators if 
He writes those things. And the list goes on and on. For example, last year, the White House Office of the Press Secretary stated that animal pollinators are responsible for 35% of the world's food. Honeybees are just one of these species, and they're responsible for 87 of the 115 food crops they evaluate. <coughs> Economically, they're worth about $24 billion to the economy, and honeybees account for about $15 billion of that. To put it simply, one out of every three bites of food you eat on a daily basis is dependent <coughs> upon bees. So if you're wondering how a state connected to bees, if, whoops, somebody was going to say it? Cows got to eat. Cows got to eat. Mm -hmm. That's right. Bumblebees are some of the chief pollinators for alfalfa. So much so that when bumblebee populations start to decline, especially in St. Louis, Ed Spivak from the St. Louis Zoo worked with a lot of horse ranchers there who said, we want to get involved because we realize that our livelihood is tightly connected to the population of bees, especially bumblebees. Now our connection to these animals doesn't stop there. Again, here are some more economics. About one third of our diet, like I said, one out of every three bites of food, $15 billion a year in U.S. crops, and honeybees pollinate about 10% of that. But how are we connected to pollinators, really? What does that really mean to us? What it really means is that we depend upon pollinators and pollinators depend upon us. That's how deep connection is. And if we take practical steps to address the problems they're facing, it's in the best interest of our future. And why would I say something like that? Again, talked a bit about food. Most of us do think about honey, but again, the fruit crops that we talked about, apples, blueberries, lemons, nuts, how important are they to these things? Let's take a look at our breakfast table. On the left, that's our breakfast in a world with bees. On the right, that's our breakfast in a world without bees. Believe it or not, the largest pollination event in the world takes place in California every year. And it is the pollination of the almond groves. The almond groves in California yield 98% of the world's almonds. And the almond growers will tell you, without beekeepers, they wouldn't be able to do it. And beekeepers will tell you, without that pollination event, we wouldn't be able to survive. So it goes far beyond just honey and our connection to it. So commercial hives create about $40 billion of product every year. There are about 2.4 million hives in operation, and over 1 million are used just to pollinate the almond grain usually about 1.4 million. If you're talking about an apple orchard in New York, about 30,000 hives are used. And in Maine, 50,000 are used to pollinate a very sweet succulent Maine blueberries. And these are just honeybees. So another way to look at it is 100% of your almond yield is dependent upon pollinators. 90% for your apples, 90% for your peaches, 48 for your oranges, and then on down the line. And as you can see, 16% of our cotton crops are dependent upon pollinators. <coughs> Let's take a look at the hardest working pollinator, the honeybee. Why do we call that the hardest working pollinator? Because They've got a huge job. They are commercial livestock. 
So if you want to know how they get to places like the almond groves, this is what a beekeeping company does. They load up their hives on a semi-truck, and then the bees start to travel across the United States. Come with their handy-dandy forklift there, because this is where they're going. These are the almond groves in California. And those honeybees are responsible for pollinating all of that. They usually arrive in the early morning, pre-dawn, and they start to unload. This is when bees, honeybees are less active. And that's one of the differences between honeybees and bumblebees. Bumblebees tend to be a bit more active at times honeybees aren't. They unload the hives, and then they let the bees go out doing what they do, pollinating all these beautiful almond trees. Now your bumblebee is the most efficient pollinator. Remember I told you a little about the shape there? They tend to specialize in things low to the ground. So if you like anything on this list, kiwi, cranberry, turnip, <coughs> pears, clovers, peppers, plums, cucumbers, squash, raspberry, strawberries, mustard, honeydew melon, bumblebees are commercial pollinators as well. And here's some of their specialty. Bumblebees don't tend to travel in very, very big numbers like the honeybees. But this is what it looks like if you visit a place that's growing tomatoes, growing blueberries, honeybee colony on a pallet right there so that they can do their good work. Um, you can actually have them shipped to you. Some people will carry them on a truck. But for example, if you have a greenhouse, you could actually go online and you can order a colony of bumblebees for your greenhouse. That'll be shipped to you in a package much like that. So when it comes to you, it'll look like this. And this is what it looks like on the inside. Not as high numbers as your honeybees. <coughs> Of course, our prettiest pollinators, our butterflies, as well as our moths. And what are they responsible for? <laughs> <laughs> Important pollinators of ornamental flowers. So, when love is in the air, wedding, Valentine's Day, sweetest day, asters, zinnias, starting to become very popular in native wildflower bouquets, and weddings. And so, roses are pretty cool, but I say, hey, give the gift of native prairie plants. <laughs> <laughs> now, pollinators are representations of our lives, and they represent it through society, through history, and our music, our art, and our pop culture. And I want to take just a few seconds to quickly zip through just how pollinators have influenced our pop culture from early radio, <coughs> graphic novels, to modern day movies. You might recognize this little tune. It's actually Flight of the Bumblebee. <laughs> but not the original version. That was done by Nikola, let me see if I make sure he get his name right, Reminsky Korsakov. That's right. He wrote that in 1899. This is the trumpet solo by Al Hertz. And if any of you recognize this, <laughs> There you have it. As you 
see these animals have influenced a lot of our pop culture. I mean, where would our comics, our graphic novels be? Be no Green Hornet, Batman, that girl. Where would Transformers be without Bumblebee? So these are things that have been connected to us back from old radio shows, comic books coming up through the 30s, 1980s, 90s, all the way till now. But these animals signify a lot to culture. For example, an artist in 2013 by the name of Hector Duarte, who grew up in Curio, Mikachoa, Mitchell, 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 there we go. Couldn't remember how to say it, didn't want to butcher it, so thank you for your help. Um, but in 2013, Hector was concerned about the lack of pride he felt residents in his town were having. Because they were starting to become saddened by people immigrating from that town to the United States to make a better life for themselves. And he wanted to try to find a way to make the people there, the residents of this area, have more pride in their hometown. So he started on an art campaign where he wanted to adorn buildings in this poverty-stricken area with beautiful pieces of art. And he felt the butterfly, especially the monarch, was the best to represent this. Because he felt that the monarch was an immigrant as well. Because after all, they migrated from Mexico into the United States, some all the way up into Canada, and come back. And when you think about it, the monarchs that start the journey aren't the monarchs that come back. It's their great-grandchildren that come back. And so he felt this really symbolized a lot of the things that, was going, that were going on in this town. He got a lot of support from the residents. And the really cool thing is that when he sent out a call for help, artists from all over the United States, even from Chicago and Evanston, painted butterflies and sent them down to him. <coughs> and this artwork is still up adorning these buildings today. I urge you to take a look, Hector Duarte, and see some of these beautiful works of art. Just included a few of them here. And butterflies in that culture are represented in everything. Their religious beliefs, poetry, art, they're a symbol of life and rebirth. Would somebody like to read this poem for me? You who go, who go through the day like a winged tiger, burning as you fly, tell me what supernatural life is painted on your wings, so that after this life, I may see you in my life. And what's your name? Nancy. Let's give Nancy a round of applause. Hey, well. <laughs> so you can see that these animals are connected to us in many, many different ways. They mean a lot to us, whether it's food, whether it's a representation of culture or art, sometimes it's even to give us entertainment. But, unfortunately, these animals are facing a plot. And two of the main things are pesticides and herbicides. These are some of the things that are causing problems. The decline of pollinators will affect us all. This is why we need to preserve their habitats and ecosystems that they depend on, and we can do that through responsible management. The reason I say that is because a lot of studies have been done to try to figure out what is causing the decline in honeybee populations. Now, you will read a lot of interesting articles out there. Some that say the honeybee populations are on the rise. However, I just watched a special where a company that owns honeybees as commercial livestock said they are not going to use their honeybees 
as pollinators anymore. Because every time they bring them back, they suffer a die off. So they're just going to concentrate on honey production. They said that it doesn't yield as much money, but better safe than sorry. There's also been a study by the University of Harvard, when say Harvard University, that points to a specific type of pesticide that's being used. And it's called the neonicotinoid pesticide. Now, neonicotinoid pesticide, I'm going to go past these a bit here. Neonicotinoid pesticide is a type of pesticide that agriculturists can actually put on seeds. Then when you plant the seeds, the plants grow up and they have a systemic effect. They have a residue on the plant so that when a pest insect bites the plant, it kills it. But they say that the levels are sublethal to honeybees. And what the Harvard study did was they took a look at colonies of bees that were feeding on this over time and said that the sublethal amounts, in their mind, actually did have an effect on the colonies. That it made them more susceptible to things such as complications from varroa mite infection, and often called the varroa mite the Dracula mite, from fungal infection. But they said they felt there was a direct correlation between <coughs> neonicotinoid pesticide as well as these other factors. I don't know about you, but the fruits are growing residue that's going to kill a bug when it bites it. I don't know if I want to eat it myself. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to think it's about that. Now, it's also been implicated in the decline of monarchs as well. They are starting to study to see the neonicotinoid pesticide and its correlation with the monarch decline. However, one correlation that we can see directly affecting the monarch is the use of glyphosates. Glyphosates, excuse me. Glyphosates. The glyphosates is a type of herbicide that you can usually find in things like Roundup. Now, they say that it has not been proven that these have an effect directly on insects, but what they are made to do, they do very well. You see, for a while, people thought honeybee populations and pollinator populations were declining because of the use of GMOs. Now, there's been no proof that GMOs cause any harm to pollinators. However, what they do do is, when they leach off into the environment, they do the same thing to weeds as they do to crops. They create super weeds. Stronger the weed, stronger the herbicide you need. The University of Maryland back in 2013 did a study on honeybee populations feeding from wildflowers and found that a lot of these populations suffering colony collapse disorder had a cocktail of about 21 <coughs> different herbicides in the, <coughs> the hives because of these things leaching off into the environment. But the one thing that we do know is that these weed killers kill milkweed. <coughs> the only thing that monarch babies will eat. Mother monarchs don't see milkweed. They don't want to breed. They don't want to lay eggs if they have it. Because there's nothing for the caterpillars to eat. And again, can't stress enough that without these pollinators, especially bees, Walking into the grocery store like we do now, they have a very different effect. Very, very different. Does it yeah. matter what kind of milkweed? I mean, you have like a whole list of different milkweeds. As and long as it's native yeah. milkweed, yeah. it's fine. But you want to pay attention to the type of soil that you're using. Because some milkweed tend to like very loose, coarse soil, um, such as butterfly milkweed tends to like soil with a lot more drainage. Common milkweed, from what I'm told, with all of my friends that are horticulturists, should be able to grow anywhere. <laughs> Swamp milkweed can tend to tolerate it when it's very wet. 
Um, and then you take a look at some of your other milkweed, like your prairie milkweed and your green antelope horn, that do tend to have more specialized requirements. There's a photo of our, wanted to put this up here because a lot of people tell me, I see my art all the time, I saw one, and then they ask, did you see almost a smiley face on the underside? And that's the vice droid, the great pretender, wanting to pretend to be poisonous by putting on our kids. Yes? Um, a question about the neonics. Somebody told me that that's applied also to flower seeds? Yes. And this is why when you're buying seeds for your garden, you want to be careful where you get them from because if you get them from a home improvement store, they may have already been, you know, inundated with these types of pesticides. And it doesn't have to be labeled? No. So that, but you can find nurseries and organizations that will give you genetically pure seeds and seeds that are free from these toxins, which is one of the reasons I put Applewood Seed Company's information in here because when we do our programs at the zoo, that's where we get them from. Um, you brought up the idea of predation on these, these monarchs and the, the viceroy. Um, because the monarchs are poisonous, usually they're not predated on except when you've got a young bird who doesn't know that. Right. But are the caterpillars and the eggs themselves subject to predation? Yes, they are. <laughs> And one of the, um, if you're trying to raise them, a good thing you can do is some people will actually bring them inside and raise the caterpillars. Some people actually take the eggs inside. For example, my um, vice president, Dr. Alejandro Grijal, did an experiment. He was growing milkweed outside, and what he started to see was that when the monarchs laid their eggs, ants started to crawl up and grab the eggs. <coughs> So he tried an experiment where I've got high up the stump, you just put Vaseline on. Vaseline's very good. You want to stop ants from coming in your house? Put a layer of Vaseline across the crack, they're done. <laughs> so, and so it's not toxic and they won't come through. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, yeah, you can bring the uh, leaves inside for some of our seasonal interpreters. We're doing some programming at the zoo anytime they see it egg or caterpillar, they bring it inside and they would just keep them with fresh milkweed leaves until caterpillar, you know, went into chrysalis, came out as a butterfly and released it. Yes. I think I had a question over here. Oh, I just wanted to ask when the seeds are labeled organic, you know, they are um, also great with these pesticides. I've heard Good and bad things about organic. Usually organic means that they're not, but I have heard people say that you do have to watch out for that. So you know, investigate the company well and be careful if you're getting something organic from a large chain store. Try to find out which, what company they got it from. Can you explain a little difference between, uh, my understanding is most of the honeybees you see are, are non-native, they're imports Europeans, and the native honeybees, if there is such a thing. Um, we do have some native bees here in the United States, mostly solitary bees. The European honeybee is actually an animal that has been imported to areas around the world, and so you're going to get people that are going to debate as to whether or not they are still considered invasive, because they have been in the ecosystem for so long. And so once an animal's in the ecosystem for a certain amount of time, they say, well, it's just a native animal. But there's about seven species of honeybees out there. And the major ones are the European, the African, um, and the, uh, well, European does include the Italian species. But those are your big um, honey makers right there. And the commercial ones are typically Euro European? Um, typically European. They do have the times where you have African queens that will infiltrate the colonies. You tend to see that most often in the southwestern part of the United States, especially down in Arizona. And so they're trying to work on ways where an African queen can come into the colony that they can actually find a way to breed into that colony um, some calmer gene traits. Because Africanized bees, they're just really highly defensive. Because if you think about it, they live in an area with a huge predator, the honey doctor. And so you've got to be highly defensive when you've got an animal that can turn 
steroids, like a brown bear on steroids that runs right up the tree and uh, just goes right after the eye. All right. So here are some photos of some beautiful milkweed. Again, a lot of people vilify this, saying because it has the term weed in it, that it's not an attractive plant, and it's a nuisance, but if you take a look at it, swamp milkweed, very close to a lavender color, doesn't grow that high, about knee high. Common milkweed, there's your prairie milkweed, butterfly milkweed, beautiful orange coloration, and very interesting looking Angelo corn milkweed. So we're low on time, and so how can you help? We're going to go through this quickly. Very easy. Pesticide, herbicide, free garden. And how you want to do it is up to you. A lot of people are worried I can't have a very attractive garden using native plants, <coughs> but here's a couple of photos. Olympic Sculpture Park, the Butterfly Crossing, the Brandon <coughs> Westmont, Shauna, actually painted her fence to support butterflies, as well as painting, I mean, uh, planting a lot of things that support bumblebees. Plenty of Audubon Society, gorgeous wildflowers. And if you really want to get involved, you can actually apply to have a monarch way station through Monarch Watch. And your way station can be large, <coughs> without boundaries, be small, manicure, or like the one that we planted at Brookfield Zoo right outside of our butterfly house. And again, our horticulturists there are fastidious. So they're like, no, Andre, we don't want anything six to eight feet tall in front of the butterfly house. And as you can see, you met all the requirements right there. And in the age of social media, spreading the word is very important. So if you have a Twitter account, you can pledge to help pollinators. You can follow that hashtag, Pollinator Pals. Tell your friends about it and pledge. What are you going to do? Are you going to plant a monarch garden for monarch butterflies? Are you going to be friendly? Show pesticide, herbicide free? But the most important thing is spreading the word and doing something. So, journey of a thousand miles takes that one step. And again, hopefully throughout this presentation, I hope you all understand how people and pollinators are connected, but how we can help with their plight by doing some small but very impactful things. So with that, we're a little over time. I'll say thank you and ask you all if you have any questions.